We've got some time for questions now, and we're going to open up to uh, discussion. We've got a couple of microphones on either side of the room, so um, if you'd like to ask a question, um, please just raise your hand, and if you could introduce yourself when you do that, that would be fantastic. But just uh, while we're waiting for a couple of people perhaps to uh, uh, ask a question, uh, just firstly, I might just go back to Liam at the beginning. Um, you probably didn't go into it a lot, but obviously you know, the use of uh, precision agriculture and digital ag technologies was an integral part of your planning for many of these uh, processes that you, uh, restructuring the farm businesses that you've been looking at. And uh, you know, would that have been as feasible or as possible without the technologies we have today? Do you think, Liam? Oh, I think, is this a Dorothy Dixer? I think no, the answer... I'm just asking. <laughs> the the answer is um, clearly no. And, and I guess for us, part of, um, and just touched on it, using NDVIs, EMs, et cetera, um, part of it is being able to build up rapid knowledge of new, new assets. So um, rather than having to farm them for 10 years to work out where are the reliable areas and where are the trouble areas and where do we put our inputs to get our best return, is that we can very quickly... Um, build up that that knowledge base and and using historical NDVI, you know, go back 15 years and and uh, and build that knowledge. So we use it um, extensively, EMs, topographies, um, you know, remote sensing, all that sort of stuff to to build that. We call it corporate knowledge. Um, you know, we don't have the the five generations of knowledge the day we 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 take possession, but. Um, so we use it that way and of course then with our horticultural projects, well it's integral when you're making big dollar commitments to have um, you know, the land capability well described and defined and you start applying water at large volumes, um, uh, water moves, you want to know where it's going to move to and, and how to manage or mitigate those impacts too. So yeah, it's very important. Yeah, thanks uh, Liam, that's great. Now we did have a question over here I think, did we? Up here. Yeah, hi. Um, Brendan Egan from Queensland. Um, my question is around how do we get greater investment, if you like, in connectivity so we can unleash these fantastic opportunities with digital technology as we saw from the corporate to the family farm here this afternoon? They're looking to you, <laughs> I think, Jane. <laughs> Well, perhaps we might go to Jessica first and then perhaps Jane can make a comment. Sure. Um, I guess in basic terms, it come about um, a literally a conversation in the pub. There was a, um, there, there was a, a, I suppose, a core group that, um, that didn't think that the dealership would, would probably provide that service or weren't interested in providing that service. They knew that um, by doing this, it would be affordable. Um, as I uh, mentioned, $100 a year is a very sus affordable subscription. But um, yeah, I suppose it, it really was a true community effort. And I think the tower was purchased and sourced secondhand. It was a Sunday afternoon. They went up there, one loaned out a tractor, one did the cement. It was, it was a real community effort. But um, yeah, I guess to see that replicated um, through, I'm not sure what sort of a coordinator coordinated effort that would take. There's, there's dealership based um, signal, but um, yeah, I, I think from, from my understanding, I, I haven't heard of any other community um, um, RTK um, networks like this. So um, I don't think that really answers your question, but <laughs> I might go to Jane for, yep. for the next bit, bit of the question. Yeah, look, it's a tricky one, but we found, uh, because the market isn't always great, obviously, but um, so the Keytar example was there are service providers around that are selling uh, various services to extend mobile coverage and, if, and they probably are valuable if you can do it as a cohort. Uh, but having said that, we heard from Iota, bef Miriota before, you know, there's a whole lot of different tele data communications options and I think you've really got to work out what, what data you need to move and how much and when and evaluate that because the, the mobile network's like the Rolls Royce, which you may or may not need. Um, but having said that, the other thing is that we definitely found you could just improve policy. So there's just some really ridiculous, like the single point um, NBN satellite, 
policy. There just are some policies that don't work for this sector and they're, they're just simple fixes and they don't cost much. So there's, yeah, it's going to be a combination of things. That's a dodgy answer, sorry. <laughs> there's, there's plenty more examples of collaboration. There's guys putting up um, towers for internet that are sharing the cost, um, sharing like those weather stations and the subscriptions. But um, yeah, I mean, we, that's our second weather station um, that we owned. And the, the first one, I think, was an $800, no, to $1,000 subscription per year. And that was basically to cover the cost of the, um, the phone plan in it. And in the end, it was just unworkable, $1,000 a year in amongst all the other subscriptions you pay is just unworkable. Did we probably need that 3G signal in that um, moisture probe gateway to send the data out? Maybe not. Um, it was a very expensive way of doing it. Thank you for the answers. We have another question here at the front. Yeah, Deb Kerr from uh, Australian Pork Limited. Jessica, my question's to you. Gotta love those green machines, fan of them. <laughs> But I was interested in your advisory board. Most family farms, you know, have their own internal, you know, management functions. And I'm just wondering what drove you to look at the advisory board and if its sole focus is on this innovation technology adoption, you know, down to your equipment, or is it a wider function than, than just the advisory board? Um, there was a range of um, reasons. Uh, we've been working with this company. They've been doing our grain marketing for quite some time. Um, they're trusted. There was an advisor within that company that we was local and we like working with him. So it was just a natural, natural progression um, from working with those consultants. Um, we have um, a succession plan that we've been working with over the last 10 years with Joe's parents. And I guess it, it came from um, trying to find a fair way for us to enter into the business and for them to um, exit out. And I guess the the advisory board has just been part of that process. Uh, they, they keep us honest. Anything that needs to be discussed, um, I guess, is tabled at that time. And it does um, relieve the need for any conversations that could blow up in between. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's been good for, on a human resource family level, considering there's, there's no workmen. It's just Joe and his dad and, and, um, and um, us as well, um, Joy and I. Uh, so I guess it's just having that external advisor to go to um, and ask for opinions. And, and I, I honestly think it's, it's been the best thing expensive but it's the best thing we've ever done <laughs> so thank you jessica we have another question up here on the, the left yeah um stuart hodge irrigated grain grower from new america in victoria my question is to jane and jessica how how far down the road and is it even realistic to think that we can get uh, yield data out of um, grain and, and cotton harvesters uh, uh, influencing day-to-day um, -day grain markets and cotton markets for that matter Oh, that's a, that's a hard question to answer. But um, there are issues with yield data, which you would be very well aware of. Uh, and I think that's some of the thing that we found with farm sensors. They're not perfect. And so yield monitors are, are a real classic. There's for cotton, you know, issues with moisture and all that kind of thing. So at the moment, the barriers are not being able to aggregate that data and the data not being particularly accurate. But having said that, if you can resolve those issues, it really comes down to then, which the legal team looked at, it's the terms and conditions of the use of that data between you and John Deere, and what they can and can't do with that data, who they can share it with. Leanne Wiseman is the legal team, and she is right in front of you, so I encourage you to talk to her <laughs> afterwards. Thank you, Jane. We have another question up here on my right. Uh, Chris Kelly from Kelly Grains. Um, just to you, Liam, um, do you have a uh, return on investment target for the next 10 years? And if you prefer not to answer that, uh, maybe what's your strategy to keep the cockatoos off the almonds? <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe there's um, some new technology that drones that will hunt, hunt cockatoos, so we'll have a look at that. Um, return on investment, was that the question? Yeah, because it's... Um, it's not turnkey at its, um... Yeah. Um, because it's not turnkey, we, do, we are more aggressive in terms of what our return expectations are. So um, 
it won't it won't get past the board unless there's a line of sight on more than an internal rate of return of fifteen percent, and um, and then there'd want to be a pretty good argument as to as to why we'd take it on. So, you know, we're really looking you know, twenty percent and better if we can, and uh, and you know we all know that spreadsheets and forecasts are good, and um, you know in that. In that uh, vineyard reversion, we had the, the wettest September on record and that cost us two months and a lot of money and, and uh, a lot of heartache. And so, you know, we, we try to make sure that um, there's always a bit of... We're conservative um, with, our, with our costings and, uh, and then if there's slippage, we can still, still come in and, and do better than hurdles, so, which we're able to do there. But that's where we're up to, better than 15. So it's private equity type returns and uh, I think you've, you've got to be at that level. Once we get out the other end, we've gone through that development phase and we're now, at, uh, you know, we've transformed the asset and we're now at steady state. Well, you've got to expect that there's going to be yield compression and uh, I guess the decision for us as a business is do we continue to hold the asset at that point? Do we sell out? Do we sell down and, uh, and roll that capital into, into another project? So you know, we're... We're at that point with a couple of assets now. Thanks, Liam. We have an opportunity for a few more questions. We've got a bit of time just while you're deciding whether you'd like to ask one. I'll perhaps just ask Jessica, um, you know, you've taken on this role as the president of, of the SPA group, the Precision Agriculture Association, and um, there's, there initially has been quite a slow uptake in, in the adoption of precision agriculture technologies. Um, you know, you'd like to reflect perhaps on you know, what might have been some of the factors why you know, we have seen slow uptake, although there seems to be a fair bit of interest uh, today. Yeah, um, I guess I, I think about this a lot in my everyday job. Why aren't people buying more stuff off me? Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess I've, I've put it down to the three, the three Cs, I guess. Um, one being connectivity, which has been mentioned many, many times today. Um, I guess um, it frustrates me in my everyday job, um, you know, taking two to two and a half, three hours to download a software update for a tractor is not good use of my time. So if I'm getting frustrated with it, of course, a farmer's never going to want to do it themselves. And that's just, I guess, the tip of the iceberg. Um, Compatibility is the next one. Um, ISO bus um, is, is helping that. Um, it hasn't solved um, that. That's obviously the, um, the standardised connectors and and communication systems. Um, so compatibility frustrates farmers. They'll like something about one brand and something about another, and if it doesn't work, they give up. Um, and the third thing being um, consultancy. Um, I've noticed that the greatest uptake of Precision Ag is when is usually the farmers clustered around a, um, a business that provides good consultancy, and whether that's from a really good machinery provider or an agro that's got skills or that they've got a PA consultant close to them or that they involve all three, usually they're the ones in the top 5%. Um, and I, I guess the ones in the next chunk are, are left behind because they don't have access nor the time to, to collaborate those skills and, and move to the next step. So yeah, those, those would be the three things. The one I wouldn't put in there is cost. I honestly don't think cost um, is an issue if you can if you can justify it as a, as a useful part of your business, well, then you're going to do it. Um, I, I think those other three things are the, the main things holding it back. Yeah, thanks. That's great advice. Thank you, Jess. Do we have any last questions from the audience? I couldn't see the microphone floating around. Oh, one more. Oh, this might be our last question, uh, just up here on my right. Um, Helen Thompson from Federation University. Um, just wondering, with your investors, um, you talked about data rich investments, um, what do they get to see? How do they monitor uh, what's going on if you've got precision ag and, you know, data being generated from across your various uh, farms? Uh, yeah, what, what, how's that being used to monitor how the businesses are going? Investor participation or feedback. Um, we're in a fortunate position um, our investors are a very um, the small number of them and there's a strong relationship and enormous trust between us all. So um, that's the starting point. We, um, there's, there's access to, to farm visits 
as and as and when they require. Uh, we use Mailchimp to you know, keep people abreast of of uh, what's happening, and you know people like to see a, a picture of something being destroyed and rebuilt. So there's progress checks that way, and then of course all the standard reporting in in terms of you know, financials and and project deliverables. Um, but it's uh, the, the greatest bit of technology is uh, the phone. You know, they've all got my number and I've got theirs. And if there's um, good news to report, we report it. And if there's a challenge or a bad news, we report it. And so, uh, or if they've got a concern, guess what? I hear about it. So there's nothing too fangled angle about how we do it. But we, we do, um, we are transparent in communication. Mm. Where um, we capture and utilise a lot of data, and I think. One of the elements of an investment grade asset, as we describe it, is to be data rich. Our investors aren't concerned about that, though. They know that's there and supporting decisions and, and delivering outcomes. They're not. They're not in the minutiae of, of um, you know, which paddock did what and why. They trust that's occurring. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this afternoon. I'd like to thank our speakers, Liam, Jane, and Jessica. And I'd also like to thank CRDC for sponsoring this session this afternoon.